What's going on, Experience Church? Happy anniversary as we celebrate seven years as a church today. Man, incredible. Hey, how about that worship team? That was pretty good, huh? Wow, so proud of them. And man, to all the, all the work, all the uh, sacrifice that they put into writing and producing that song. And what I'm probably most proud of them about is that their, their heart was to glorify God. Their heart was to write an anointed song that touched the heart of God and ushered us into the presence of God. And in fact, even this past week, I was talking to them and they were trying to convince me to not tell anybody that they had wrote that song and that they were even doing it. They go, let's just slip it in and just do it and not tell anybody. And I'm like, no, we can't do that. We got to celebrate what God's doing, and and uh, but it just kind of reveals their heart. That it's not about us. It's about Him. It's always going to be about Him. And so uh, I'm just grateful for the team that God's putting together. And I say that because uh, I believe that there are more uh, songwriters sitting in the audience today. I believe there's more vocalists, there's more musicians that are sitting in the audience today. And I pray that you would be inspired by what you saw them do today, knowing that there's more in you. And you, we actually, our team would be better if you were on it. And so I hope you would be inspired to jump on that team and let's do something incredible for the kingdom of heaven. But they did an incredible job. And, and by the way, uh, for those of you that might be new with us, maybe haven't got a chance to, to meet you yet, my name is Kyle Brownlee. I serve as the lead pastor here at Experience Church, and we're honored to have you with us today. You picked a great day to come hang out with us. Also want to take a moment to look into the camera and say a big hello to all the men and women joining us from the Correction Center of Northwest Ohio, all those watching online. We love you. We believe in you. Come on, D-Town, and we welcome our church family today. So good. So good. Wow, incredible. It's hard to imagine all that God has done in seven years as a church. And I want to start things off by taking a look at a passage of Scripture that I'm always reminded of whenever we come together and celebrate our anniversaries. And it's found in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 10 through 12. And it says this, it says, when God... Your God ushers you into the land that he promised. In other words, that, that this was his plan all along. And because of that, it turned out way better than we even thought it was going to be. And he says, through your ancestors, Abraham, Isaac, and, and Jacob, to, to give you this land he promised. And he says, you're going to walk uh, into large, bustling cities that you didn't build. That you're going to accomplish things you, you, do, you, didn't even, you never even imagined. That when you go into well-furnished houses that you didn't buy, you're going to come upon wells that you didn't dig and vineyards and olive orchards that you didn't plant. In other words, when you, when you look around at all the things that are happening, you're going to think to yourself, well, well, we did some things. We worked hard, but there's no way we could have done all this. There's no way we could have made all of this happen. There's no way that, that this happened because of us. Clearly, God's hand and God's favor is on us as a church. And it goes on to say, when you take it all in and you settle down, and here we see the, the Bible encouraging us that, that there should be times when we reflect on what God's done. That there should be times when we look back and we remember the goodness of God in our lives. And, and, and when we look back and you're settled down and when you're pleased and when you're content, make sure that you don't forget how you got there. Never lose sight of how you got there. And we never want to forget what God has done and what he is doing in this church. We never want to lose sight of what he's done in our own personal lives either. In fact, this past week, as I was just kind of reflecting on some of the things that have happened these past seven years, I, I kind of started to go way, way back and, and start to remember some of the, the goodness of God in my life. I, I started to think about those, those days when I was addicted and alcohol and drugs had, had taken over my life and how I kept running to those things that would never satisfy me simply because they would numb out the pain that I was carrying around with me, that I'd run to those, those things because because it was a brief escape uh, from the shame and the guilt that I had because some of the choices that I made in my life. I was reflecting and remembering what that jail cell uh, felt like and, and how cold and lonely it was. I was remembering how my life had no real purpose or direction, how, how I felt lost, but I, I didn't know where to turn but God. Somebody say, but God. 
but God intervened, but God reached down from heaven, and I encountered him in a way that changed my life forever. And I just was reflecting and, and remembering about the goodness of God in my life. And I've been asked over the years, Pastor Kyle, what's your favorite verse in the Bible? Like, what's your life verse? And so I want to give it to you uh, this morning. It's Titus chapter 3, verses 3 through Five and and this is my life verse. Uh, I came to figure this out is because there was probably a couple of years where every sermon I preached for like two years, I would work this scripture into it somehow, and uh, because I just related to it so much. And the truth be told, this this was the first time where the Bible spoke to me. This was the first time that I was reading the Bible, and I just was I just wasn't reading it. It started to read me. And how many know things change when the Bible starts to read you? And I saw myself in it for the first time. I was a student out at Teen Challenge, uh, this Christian alcohol and drug rehab. And I I was in my room by myself, and I read Titus chapter 3, and I was like, that's me. And like I'm, I'm running around the room like, does anybody see? i got to tell somebody, this is me. God just spoke to my heart. So I want to share it with you today. Verse 3, Titus chapter 3, says, once we too... We're foolish and disobedient. Now you know why it's my life for you. Why, sir? That's totally me. This is me. But it goes on to say, this is the part that really hit me. We were misled. And we became slaves to many lusts and pleasures. And our lives were full of evil and envy. And we hated each other. And I thought, that's me. I've chased so many mirages I've been in, enslaved, I've been misled by my passion, I've been enslaved by, enslaved by my lust and pleasures. But then verse 4 came. But God, but God, when God our Savior revealed his kindness and when he revealed his love, he saved us. Not because of the righteous things that we had done, but because of his mercy. That he washed away our sins, giving us a new birth and a new life through the Holy Spirit. So good. I was reflecting and remembering this verse when love came down, how God gave me a life I never thought possible. And when I was thinking about that moment, you know what I realized? That's when Experience Church was birthed. In that room, in that moment, when God revealed his kindness and his love to my heart. And then, and then that, this became my life's mission. This became my, my life's passion to see as many people as possible experience the kindness of, and love of God in their lives too. And so I go on this journey of, uh, of helping as many people as I possibly can. And along the way, I end up meeting this smoking hot girl named Justina Clem. Maybe you've heard of her. And she fell madly in love with me. Head over heels in love with me. I had to fight her off with a stick for a few weeks just to play it cool and play hard to get a little bit. And it worked. She kept pursuing me. I'm joking a little bit. But the truth be told, you know what, when I first got introduced to, to Justina, my buddy that introduced me said, this is how he described her. There's this one girl I want to introduce you to because I've been at some prayer meetings with her at, at church, and when she prays, heaven responds. And that's how he described her to me. And I met her. And you know what her passion is? You know what her life's mission was? To see as many people as possible experience the kindness and love of God in their lives. So we got together and we started this journey together. And before we knew, we ended up meeting another couple named Bill and Stephanie Lomers. And you know what's crazy? Their, their life's mission, you know what they're passionate about? Seeing as many people as possible experience the kindness and love of God in their lives. And so we moved to Defiance, Ohio with this dream that we could have a church where it didn't matter what background, it didn't matter what you look like, it didn't matter what you've done or didn't do, it didn't matter how good you could look on Sunday, but you still got some issues going on in your life, that you could come in this place and have an encounter with God's grace, have an encounter with God's love, have an encounter with the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, experience His kindness and His love and never be the same 
So we move to Defiance, and we're telling people about this, this church God has had put in our hearts to have. And, and then 47 adults jumped on our launch team. 47 people whose mission, who are passionate about seeing as many people experience the kindness and love of God in their lives. And then on September 16, 2012, we launched Experience Church, and I was blown away at the 272 people who came to church that day. And for the past seven years, that list, that number has continued to grow and grow and grow and grow and get bigger. And we were just looking at some of the numbers. Over 2,000 people these past seven years has given generously, served faithfully, and sacrificed selflessly to see the vision of Experience Church lived out. How incredible is that? In fact, our, our mission, our mission here at Experience Church is to see as many people as possible know God through our Sunday morning services, that we want Christians to grow, we want Christians to be challenged, but at the same time, we're going to present the gospel of Jesus Christ every single yeah. week. We want people to know God, not just know God in their heads, but to know God in their hearts. And then we want as many people as possible to find freedom. We primarily do this through our small groups where we could get into some life-giving, life-changing relationships and get rid of our yesterdays so that we can move into our tomorrows. So we want as many people as possible to find freedom. And then we want as many people as possible to discover their purpose. And we do that through the Connect Track where we, we discover our, our spiritual gifts, our, our personalities. What are we passionate about? And how can we use those gifts and personalities and passions to be a blessing to somebody else? We like to say around here, there's two great days in our lives. The day we were born and the day we discover why we were born. And we want as many people as possible to, to make a difference by jumping on the dream team and locking arms together and impacting the world around us. Because God has made an impact in each and every one of us. And as we celebrate seven years as a church today and, and as we think about all the, all the things that God has, has done uh, in and through our lives, I want to just give us just a few things that God has done in these past seven years. Did you know that in the past seven years, we've seen 5,940 salvations? I don't even know how to wrap my mind around that, to be honest with you. I don't, I don't even know how to had to comprehend that, 5,940 lives that have experienced the kindness and love of God through our Sunday morning services, out of the correctional facilities, out of CCNO and in our jails, out of the juvenile detention center and the drug and alcohol rehabs that we partner with, and even in other countries that God has allowed us to travel to. Almost 6,000 people have encountered the love of God and are never the same. Then in these past seven years, did you know that we have given beyond our walls, we have given away 732,615 dollars and 26 cents, just to be exact. Well, who'd have thought? Who'd have thought a church in little old Defiance, Ohio could be that generous? God did. God did. God knew the whole time. And then, then I love this, that every single month, people from Experience Church sponsor 89 children in the country of Belize. 89 children that we said we're going to make sure that they get a meal every single day, and then we're going to pay for their education to set them up to have a bright future in Jesus' name. That we're making a difference in another country Every single day, every single month. Another cool statistic, the past uh, 12 months, this past year, we've seen 1,181 people participate in small groups, which is a big deal, building life-giving, life-changing relationships together. And then we have almost 500 people who serve on our dream team each and every week. People who set up and tear down all of this. People who make coffee. People who lead us in worship. Who sit behind the camera. People who invest in our children while we're in here being ministered by, uh, to by God. People who stand at the door and smile and make people feel welcome as they walk into church. And when I think about just some of the things that God 
has done these past seven years, I'm reminded of this verse, Psalms 115, verse 1. It says this, not to us, Lord, not to us, but to your name be the glory because of your love, because of your faithfulness. So as we celebrate seven years today, I also want to talk about where we're going in the days ahead as a church. And like it's been mentioned, tonight is, is deeper night. And I just want to encourage you guys, if you've never been, God does something, God does something special. In fact, as I was praying for deeper night this past week, I felt like God, God almost gave me this picture. Because how many know when we draw near to God, he'll draw near to us? I almost felt like God gave me this picture where he's just up in heaven, just waiting. Like all I need you to do is move an inch. Like just just give me a little centimeter. Let me just get, let me just see you move a little. If you just take a little tiny step in my, I'm running to you. If my kids would just try, draw near a little bit, I'm going to run to them. I just really feel like, I really feel like God wants to do something special. In fact, yesterday I was praying with a friend of mine and they were like going off. Uh, I just like storm in heaven, uh, praying some powerful prayers. Uh, and all they were praying about was like deeper night. And he, and he got done. I'm like, dude. Sunday morning's gonna be good too. Like, we can pray for that. Like, it ain't all about deeper night, but it's gonna be good. I just want you to know that. And then also, you can mark your calendars October 6th. We are gonna do uh, our annual At the Movies series where we take popular movie clips, pull out biblical principles from them. It's a, it's a very unique, uh, uh, just awesome series we do every year. And every year, God does some incredible things. And it's a great series to invite someone who doesn't go to church. They can come in and have an encounter with a name that's above every single name. And so I want you to put that on your calendars. And then also, I do want to talk about uh, the elephant in the room and us moving to Northtown Mall. And, and so I want you to know that potentially... Potentially, <laughs> not that elephant in the room, different elephant. Well, we better move on real quick. That could get dangerous. But potentially, we're looking at moving into Northtown Mall and having our first service on December 1st. And so, I was... I was telling somebody before service that on Facebook a couple months ago, I had this like new reminder, you know, like six years ago. You ever get those? Obviously you do. And it said three years ago, I had a mentor of mine uh, come to town, and uh, Pastor Lee Domain, and uh, he didn't even preach at the church at that time. And we were just talking about uh, the church. I'm like, man, this thing, we've, we've been talking about this thing, at least I have, for almost four years now. I've been working on having a permanent home and and so someone's like, man, it's only like 10 weeks away. I'm at a point where I don't even know if I believe it. I've been working on it for so long. Like, I'll believe it when I see it. Yeah, well, you can go right over there. Yeah, I still don't believe it. We'll just see it. But God's doing something incredible. And I've had a lot of people ask me what it's going to look like, what's going to be like. And so I wanted to give you a little snapshot uh, of our future home. Take a look.
It's exciting, isn't it? I don't know, my, my favorite part, I don't know if you noticed or not, but the, the pastor they put on the stage, he was looking, they nailed that, didn't they? Really good, really good. I'm teasing, I'm teasing, but hopefully that makes you excited, and, and hopefully one of the things you see in that, that video is that we're about excellence, not being extravagant, but excellence, and, and, and so we wanted to, uh, to be well, because we're not just thinking about uh, well done, because we're not just thinking about today, we're thinking about how many of seven years from now. And seven years after that, seven years after that, and all the lives are going to be touched and changed. And even as we saw those robotic kids that didn't know how to dance, which was accurate in some regards. Um, <laughs> we didn't have any other moves in the computer that we could do. <laughs> I, 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 I'd be salty about it. I don't know. But, um, man, I... At the same time, I think about all the kids that are going to be touched in that place and the lives that are going to be healed, all the, all the people that are going to be restored in that place. Because how many of us know it's so much more than a building? Yeah. So much more than a, a building that, that allows us to reach more people, do more things, and make a greater impact in our community and beyond. And as we celebrate seven years today, I think it's interesting that in the Bible, the number seven represents uh, is the number of completion. That, that, that God created the heavens and the earth, and he created man and woe man in six days, and then on the seventh day, he rested. Completion. Then I also think it's interesting that the number eight in the Bible is the number of new beginnings. I think it's interesting as a church, like we didn't plan it out. Listen, I've been working on this for four years. I've been trying to get into a permanent home for four years now, but just how many know God's timing's perfect? I think it's interesting that, that we are making the jump to our, our permanent home here in, in 10 weeks or so, and uh, that, that some things have been completed, but how many know there's a new beginning for a lot of the things that God wants to do in and through this church? But at the same time, I believe it's a new beginning for many of us in our lives, too. I'm believing this would be a year for, for new beginnings in, in our marriages. That this would be a year of new beginnings for us in our families. That this would be a year of new beginnings in our relationship with God. That God would do some new things in our hearts and in our relationship with him. That this would be a year of new beginnings in our schools, in our community. That people would encounter God in a new and fresh way like they've never encountered him before. That this would be a year for defiance in northwest Ohio of new beginnings. And as we, as we celebrate seven years and we think about the new things that God wants to do in our lives, I want to give us today seven keys or seven things that we have learned in seven years. And I feel like i got about seven minutes to do it. So let's just pray God would just expand those minutes in Jesus' name. But if you're taking notes... The first thing that we've learned, and I want you to know that these things that we've learned as a church, they don't just apply to the church. They also apply to our own individual lives, too. And so that's how I want you to receive it today. So the first thing that we've learned is, number one, is to dream bigger. Dream bigger. And I, I don't know about you, but, but too often I've limited what God wanted to do in and through my life. And, and I wonder how many opportunities I've missed simply because I said it was impossible and I didn't dream big enough. In fact, I'll, I'll never forget on that first Sunday, standing at the, the glass doors, watching the cars drive on the parking lot, thinking to myself, people are actually coming I better figure out what I'm going to say. I can't believe this is happening. You see, there was a time when my dream, when my prayer to God was, God, help us just have a church on Sundays. And I can just, I can only imagine God looking down from heaven going, that's the dream? That's the big thing you're asking me to do, just to have church on Sunday. I didn't just call you to have church on Sundays. I called you to go into the correctional facility. I called you to go into the juvenile detention center. I called you to go into drug and alcohol rehabs. I called you to launch dream centers and reach out to this community. I called you to see as many people as possible experience the kindness and love of God. I called you to something bigger, bigger. Isaiah says it this way in, in chapter 55, verse 8 through 9, says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are, are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. It's almost like God's reminding us, I'm bigger than you think I am. I do this with my little three-year-old son, Braxton. I just look at him and go, who's bigger than you, Braxton? He goes, Dad and me. I go, no, no, who's bigger than you? He goes, Dad and me. 
I'm like, no, bro. Like, who's faster than you? He goes, dad and me. I'm like, you don't get it. But at least you're putting me first, right? It's almost like God's doing that with us. Who's, remember who's bigger than you. Remember, remember who's bigger than you are. And he says this in verse 9. As the heavens are higher than the earth, remember your place, and, and remember where I sit, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts are higher than your thoughts. And so the question I want to ask us today, where have we limited God in our lives? Where have we not dreamed big enough? I wonder how many songwriters are sitting in the audience today, how many musicians, how many vocalists are sitting in the audience today, and you've limited what God wanted to do in your life. I can't do that. That's impossible. There's no way. Can I just tell you? Dream bigger. Come on, dream bigger. Dream bigger. Dream bigger. But hey, I just want you to know, as you dream bigger, you're going to have to work harder. At some point, that dream has to turn into a reality. Dream big, go big. I wonder who needs to, keep, who needs to dream big today, and then you need to go big. That's a word for somebody. I didn't say that the other two services. I'm just telling you. Dream big, go big. Let's go. Second thing that we've learned over these past seven years is number two, is that big things often have small beginnings. Big things often have small beginnings. You know, one of the things I feel like God has blessed over the years as a church, as, as much as we try to plan, as much as we try to be prepared for everything that we do around here, there comes a time, there comes a point when you just have to step out and just start. Like there comes a time when you just, you got to stop talking about it and you just got to start doing it. In fact, I love what Zig Ziglar says. He, he said, you don't have to be great to start, but you do have to start to be great. You don't have to be great to start. But you're going to have to start in order to be great. And I think there are moments, at least in my life, when I have looked at other people and where they were at that I wanted to be. I've looked at maybe other churches, other pastors. Maybe they have buildings. Maybe they're making an incredible impact for God. And I've looked at where they were, but I didn't realize or even think about the sacrifice it took in order for them to get there. So I looked at where they were that I wanted to be that I wasn't at yet. And then I said this phrase. Maybe you have said it. I know it, you guys probably have it. First and second service probably does. But they would look, we would look at other people and we'd say, must be nice. Must be nice to have that. Must, must be nice to, to be there. Not realizing the sacrifice and the commitment that it took in order for them to get there. I just see the big things that I want. Not realizing all those things had a small beginning. I was sitting around with uh, some, some leaders in our community this, this past week, and, and uh, one, of, one leader in particular, he's retired now, but he's incredibly successful. Multi-millionaire. You would look at his life and you would say, come on, third service, don't play all spiritual. You know, you say it in your head, must be nice. As he gets ready to go back to Florida, his Florida home, must be nice to have that option. And he was telling about how he was, has built his business, and there was a time many, many years ago as he was building his business that he had to go 27 weeks without a paycheck. Small beginning. Ain't nobody looking at him back then when he wasn't getting a paycheck for 27 weeks going, must be nice. So often we look at where somebody is not realizing the sacrifice it took in order to get there. You don't got to be great to start, but you do have to start in order to be great. There's a great example of this in the Bible with the Israelites building God's temple, building God's church. Sound familiar? Zechariah chapter 4 verse 10 says, do not despise these small beginnings, for the Lord rejoices just to see the work begin. You know why God rejoices just to see the work begin? Because he realized when you'll start what he's called you to do, anything's possible. What do you need to start today that you've been talking about, that you've been dreaming about? What do, what do you need to start today that God's been calling you to? Because God knows as soon as you start, anything, anything can happen. The third thing that we've learned over these years is number three, we're better together. We're better together. You know, you know what makes Experience Church so special? It's, it's not the, the worship music, as amazing as they are. It's not the, the preaching, as dynamic as it is. Amen. You know what makes Experience Church so special? The people. The relationships. 
the community that happens. And so if you only come to church every once in a while, and that's the only thing you do, you know you're only experiencing 25% of what God is doing in this place. You're missing out on 70. You're actually missing out on the greater chunk and even better part. Because in that other 75% is this community of people that come together and are building life-giving, life-changing relationships. So that when we're discouraged, we got some people around us saying, come on, keep going. I believe in you. God believes in you. Come on, you can do this. And so when we're up against some struggles, we got this community of people that's rallying around us to do life with. To come alongside us in the good times and to come alongside us in the difficult moments of our lives. That's why we're so big around on small groups around here because we make each other better as we do life together. That we have a better marriage because we jumped into a marriage small group and we allow some people to speak into our relationship. We allow some people to speak into our blind spots. And then we met some other couples who are on the same journey that we're on and we built some friendships and, and together we're better. We're making each other better. Our finances are better because we jumped into a financial small group and we, and we got challenged and we learned how to, how to make a b- b- budget <laughs> and steward the finances God has entrusted to us. And before we know it, we had to do some work. We had to, had to stay the course, had to put some time in. But we got out of debt, and we paid off some bills, and we started to live uh, on less than what we made instead of overspending and going into more debt. And all of a sudden, we have this margin. All of a sudden, we don't fight about and have the stress about finances in our relationship. And it's allowed us to be more generous than ever before and impact other people's lives because we're better together. We jump on the team, we we serve together, we got people praying for us, sending us scriptures throughout the week, and all of a sudden we just, we have part of this community that makes us better. How many know we can do more together than we can on our own? I can't go into the jails every week on my own, but we can together. I can't impact this community and serve the people in this community through the Defiance Dream Center on my own, but we can together. I can't fix any car that pulls into that automotive bay at the Dream Center. Trust me, I can't fix any of them. (laughs) But we can with some of y'all. We can't, we can do more together. I love what Ephesians chapter 4 says. Verse 16 says, He, being God, makes the whole body fit together perfectly. God has this innate ability, doesn't he, to take our gifts and mesh them with your gifts and fit them all together. Take my personality and fit it together with your personality. I love this because God's speaking to you, you be you and I'll be me, right? You don't have to be the, like the person sitting next to you and I don't have to be like you, right? We're, we're different and God has this innate ability to, to fit it all Together, I wonder how many marriages are like that today. As each part does its own special work, it helps the other parts grow. It helps the other parts get better so that the whole body is healthy and growing and full of love, community. The fourth thing that we've learned over these years, if you're taking notes, is number four, is that spiritual warfare is real. Spiritual warfare is real. I I think too often even Christians lose sight of the fact that we're in a spiritual battle and we have a spiritual enemy. Even Jesus said this in John chapter 10, verse 10. He said, the thief, your spiritual enemy, Satan, his entire purpose is to steal, kill, and destroy. But my purpose, Jesus said, is to give you a rich and satisfying life. That spiritual warfare is real. How how many of us know that many of the problems that we are facing in our lives today are spiritual? Most people don't realize that. Most people think, well, if I could just change my situation, if I could just change my circumstance and alleviate this struggle, this problem, it's going to fix everything. If I could just get a nicer house, if I could just get a better spouse, if I could just exchange these kids. Come on, somebody. That might be true, but anyways, if I could just get out of debt, if I could just get that promotion, if I could just change my situation, if I could just move to another city, but how many of us know your problems will just follow you there because the issue is spiritual. It's a spiritual problem that got you into that mess, and it's a spiritual answer that's going to get you out of it. You keep looking at your problems with this natural perspective. You're in a spiritual battle. 
Spiritual warfare is real. And sometimes when we talk about spiritual warfare, I think we, we, we think of like these spooky demons flying around and, and Satan running around in this like tight red spandex suit with a pitchfork. That ain't what we're talking about. And that's weird too, by the way. Let me give you a simplistic definition of the spiritual battle that many of us fight, all of us fight day in and day out. The spiritual battle that you're in, I know there's other levels, but the spiritual battle that every single one of us fight day in and day out is to stay connected to God. Think about the struggles you have. Think about the tragedy, tragedies you've been through. Think about the problems that you've been up against. Think about all those things. What's the one thing they have in common? Every one of them are trying to pull you away and disconnect you from God. Every one of them. As you sin, what does that do? It separates you from God. Go through a hardship, a tragedy. What's, what's the enemy of our soul want to whisper in our, ear, our ears? You can't trust God. Why did he let you go through that? He wasn't there. You, you can't trust him. Don't stay connected to him. It's the spiritual battle we are in every day. That I would connect, my, every day I would connect my heart with God. I would spend time in prayer. I'd spend time reading the word. Not in a religious way, but I want to get God's truth in my heart. So I don't keep believing a lie and I'm enslaved and deceived by all these passions and pleasures. No, I want, I want to be enslaved by the truth of God's word. I'm going to spend some time worshiping God and connecting my heart with heaven. But you know how it is. I, we've all been there. We wake up late. we got a busy day. So we just, I don't got time to spend with God today. No condemnation in, in Jesus. And then the next day, before we know it, it's been, it's been a week since we've even prayed. And then if we go to church that day, that's the only day we spend any time with God. And we go throughout our week. And then and we miss church the next, ne next thing you know, it's been weeks, I mean, it's been months since we've, we wake up one day and we're so disconnected from God. Are we winning the spiritual battle we're in or are we losing? We're losing. And not even on purpose. Not even with bad intentions. How many know, how many know the enemy of our soul will, doesn't mind us going to church, doesn't even mind us following God. He, as long as he can get us to, to put God as a priority down further on the list, he's okay with that. Just put your family first. Just put your kids first. These are good things. And we got to love our kids. Got to Got to help them. Got, I got to pour and invest in them, invest in my family, invest in my marriage, my career. All, these are all good things, important things. But the enemy loves just put, yeah, put, put God down like number seven or eight. He's no longer a priority. How many of us know the enemy of our soul doesn't mind if we're successful as long as he can separate us from our Savior? In fact, he would almost rather you be successful because you would think you're winning when really you're losing the spiritual battle because you've drifted from God. That's the spiritual battle we are in. And I'm telling you, God is calling us as a church to get back to our first love of putting God first and living a God-first life. The problems, I'm telling you, the problems and struggles you face right now, many of them, most of them, if not all of them, are spiritual. And the answer is spiritual. And when we understand that spiritual warfare is real, then we can be more prepared and ready to face the battle. The fifth thing that we've learned over the years, number five, is that God opens doors no man can shut. God opens doors no man can shut. This reminds us of who calls the shots. God calls the shots. That it doesn't matter what anyone else says. It doesn't matter what anyone else thinks. If God opened the door, no man can shut it. And I was reminded of this this past week when I was thinking about the time when God put the dream uh, in my heart to have uh, a jail ministry. To have our services out at the correctional facility out at CCNO. And I'll never forget, I went to a city council meeting with the whole purpose uh, is because I knew the director at the time, they're no longer the director, but at the time, uh, the director of CCNO, uh, the correctional facility was going to be at the city council meeting. So I went there and sat through that meeting for two hours 
waiting for it to be done so I can make a beeline to the director and tell him what God had put in my heart. And two days later, after the meeting ended, he ran out the door. I had to chase him down, met him in the parking lot. I said, hey, hey, we want, we want to start having our services out at CCNO. And he's like, oh, we already have churches that come out and minister. I go, no, no, what we want to do is different. We want to, like, show our services, like, make them a part of our church family, come alongside them. There, no other, nobody's doing this and he goes, well, I've never heard of that before. Here's my card. Shoot me an email. So an hour later, I did. <laughs> Unfortunately, no response. I emailed him the next day and the next day and the next day. And you know how the story is going. No response. And then we had a, had a business leader catch wind of, uh, of what we were trying to do. And they just have a heart for people. They have a mission. They have a passion to see as many people experience the kindness and love of God in their lives too. And they caught wind of, of what we were trying to do. And they said, well, when you do get that meeting, can I go with you? And I said, absolutely. So my next email I name dropped. Come on. Let's go. Come on. Grind in here. Name dropped. Within an hour got a response back. Let's go. Got him. Right? And so I realized that sometimes it's not what you know, it's who you know. His name is Jesus. And he will open doors in your life that no man can shut. And so we're sitting at this meeting, and just so you know, the director's not even looking at me. He's not even talking to me. He's asking questions, and I, I, could not, I, I might as well not even be in the room. But I am. And we go on this tour of the jail, and we're going all these different things, whatever. I'm like, bro, I've got many years of experience of being in these places. Like, I don't need a tour. I've seen everything I need to see. I can tell you what's behind that door. I already know. And I do not want to go back there. Get me out now. Can we have this meeting in the parking lot, please? And then we were in, next thing I know, we were in the library. And the director and some other staff members were there. They were... Uh, just talking to us, and finally the business leader I was with, he, he basically goes, can we just cut to the chase? Like, this is taking forever. Um, and so the director goes, he goes, what do you need? And the director goes, well, all of our funding is getting cut, and we're going to have to stop all of these programs that we believe in to help these men and women out here, and we're going to have to lay off a lot of people and fire people because we don't have the funding for them. And so he goes, we need about $50,000 to continue our programming and give us a couple months to be able to secure funding for these programs so we don't have to stop uh, giving these programs to these inmates and we don't have to lay anybody off. And so the business leader looks at him and goes, okay, probably could have said that two hours ago, but I'm sure he, th he didn't say that, but he thought that. He said, all right, well, I'll how about next week I'll write you a check for $50,000, but it's contingent upon you letting experienced church have their services in this jail. That's your response to that story? That's all you got? That's ex as excited as you are going to get? I'm sitting in the library zoning out. And I'm like, what just happened? What just went down right in front of me? I'll tell you what happened. God opened a door no man could shut right in front of me. Right in front of me. So good. Revelations 3.8. I know your deeds, God said. See, I have placed before you an open door that no one can shut. I know that you have little strength, yet you have kept my word. You've walked in integrity. You're about high character. You've not denied my name. The sixth thing that we've learned these past seven years, and number six, is to rest in God's yes. Rest in God's yes. That we can have peace and that we can rest because we know at the end of the day, this wasn't our idea in the first place. This wasn't our plan. I never even heard of Defiance, Ohio, until God put it on my map. This wasn't my plan to have church in a basketball gymnasium at a YMCA. What kind of plan is that, God? This wasn't my idea to begin with, and you said to do it. So I can rest in your yes because it was your plan in the first place. I'm just following you with my life. I'm just trying to live out God's call on my life. 
And I think some of us need to know that, that that dream that's in our heart, that's not your dream. That's God's dream. That future you see, that vision you have, that's not your future. That's God's future for you. I love 2 Corinthians 1.20. It says this, for all of God's promises have been fulfilled in Christ with a resounding yes. And through Christ are amen, which means Yes, ascend to God for his glory. Amen, amen means yes. Listen, God said yes. So it doesn't matter how difficult it might seem. It doesn't matter how far we still have to go. It doesn't even matter what the situation looks like. If God is for us, who can be against us? I don't, I don't know. I don't know what obstacles are in front of you today. But the one thing I do know, God is bigger. And God is greater than anything you face in front of you today. And because of that, we can rest in his yes. Now before I get to the seventh thing God has taught us over the years, I want to be honest with you. There's really eight. And I just discovered this last night. There's actually eight things that we've learned as a church these past seven years, but I didn't want to wait another year to give it to you. And since I'm already over time, and I'm already in trouble with the entire kids department, I figure, let's just go for bonus time and do it. You with me? I need to know that you're with me. I mean, if I'm gonna get in more trouble, I need to know we're in it together. It wasn't my fault, it was yours. So let me give you number eight, and then I'll give you number seven. Sound good? So number eight, this is not in your notes. This is not on the screen. This is nowhere but in my heart, okay? Number eight, prayer is more powerful than you think. The reason, the reason I believe, I truly believe God is doing what he's doing in this place the reason we're seeing miracles happen, the reason we're seeing this move of God, the reason why we're seeing restoration and healing and deliverance, the reason why, we're, why we're, we're seeing God do what only he can do in a YMCA basketball gymnasium is because we got a bunch of prayer warriors and intercessors and because of all the hours that we have spent on our face crying out to heaven for God to do what only he can do, for God to move in this place, for God to open blind eyes, for God to bring the hearts of his people back to him, crying out, God, if you don't move, nothing's going to happen. If you don't say the word, it's not going to come to pass. God, only you can do it. And so we're on our face crying out to heaven, God, move. God, move. And I'm telling you, Prayer is more powerful than you think. And I'm saying that because I believe in prayer. I've always believed in prayer. I've always known, I believe people prayed me into the kingdom. I believe prayer is powerful. But what I've learned these past seven years is that prayer is even more powerful than I thought. Even more. That was number eight. Number seven. He's faithful. God is faithful. Time and time again, time and time again, he, is, he has reminded me in my own life, and time and time again, he's reminded us as a church that he is faithful. Wow. I love that, that scripture in the Bible that says, even when we're faithless, even when I've lost hope, even when I feel like I'm at a breaking point, even when I feel like I got nothing left, even though I, I get it to a point I don't think it's going to happen and it's not going to come to pass, even when I'm faithless, God remains faithful. Yeah. I want to close with this, this passage of scripture that I was reading in Mark chapter 10 this past week. And Scripture's a real famous scripture, but I saw it kind of in a different light. I was reading Mark chapter 10, and it talks about this, this wealthy individual who comes before Jesus, and they say, Rabbi, teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What must I do to be saved? 
Jesus being full of wisdom, the genius of Jesus, knows the entire situation, knows this man's heart, throws out a, a few commandments. And the man goes, teacher, all of these I've done ever since I was a little boy. And Jesus looks at him and says, well, there's one thing you still lack. Go sell all of your possessions and come and follow me. Gives this man an incredible opportunity to get up and close and personal with the Savior of the world. And the Bible tells us that the man walked away sad because he was wealthy. And he wasn't willing to surrender and trust God on that level. I can do all this, but I can't give it all to you. I can't surrender everything to you. I can't trust you like that. Well, as you, you keep reading the story. It's crazy because I, lo I just love, I love the realness of the Bible. And so the disciples are watching this go down between this guy and Jesus. And then they're seeing this guy walk away. And they're freaked out. They're like, can I just give you a third service realness? They're like, crap. That, that dude was really good. Like, I know that guy. Like, he's got the reputation. He's really godly. Like, he's been following the commands ever since he was a little boy. Like, that dude practically walks on water. That dude does everything perfect. That, do, that guy does everything right. And they're, like, looking at each other going, we're just a bunch of fishermen that have issues. Like, we got stuff. Like, we've blown it many times. And they're like, if that guy can't get saved, how could we? And they ask Jesus, well, then who can be saved? And they're starting to doubt if they can even experience the life that Jesus has for them. And Jesus responds with this profound answer. It's in Mark chapter 10, verse 27. And Jesus, he looks at the disciples. And he says, with man, it's impossible. But with God, all things are possible. Anything can happen. I love the genius of Jesus because he's not just answering the question of salvation. He's giving them the answer to their lives. He's looking at Peter. You don't even know, Peter, what I want to do in your life when you surrender it all to me. You have no idea. What I can do in your life when you surrender it all to me. Anything is possible. Anything can happen. Anything. It's impossible with man, but it's possible with God. Anything's possible. How many know if God's called us to it, he'll see us through it? That we can trust God with everything that we have. You know why? Because he's faithful. Because he's faithful. Man, what if we were marked by that mentality? What if we had that mentality in our own personal lives? What if we had that mentality as a church that anything is possible? How many of us know that God has called Experienced Church to be a faith-filled church? Where we believe that God can do the impossible. Anything can happen in the presence of the King. Anything can happen when King Jesus shows up. Anything is possible. But God has called us to, to be marked by the gift of faith as a church. This courage and this confidence that God, if you said it, it can come to, it can come to pass. Anything can happen. And I believe if we would live this way, this would be the catalyst for us to see even more signs and wonders break out in our community. That anything's possible. That we're, that we're going to, to, to consider everything is in before we would consider everything to be out. Anything's possible before anything's not possible. That we would believe, you know what, we can bring the sick before Jesus and they can actually get healed. That people who are addicted can actually be delivered. That miracles can happen because of the name of Jesus. That anything's possible because God is he's faithful. He's faithful. He's faithful. I don't, know, I don't know where you're at today. But this I do know. He's faithful. And even if you're faithless, God remains faithful. 
you pray with me today? Father, we love you in this place, God. Wow. Wow, what you have done and what you're doing, it's nothing short of a, of a miracle. It's nothing short of a move of your spirit, God. And as we come before you today, and we worship you, God, by giving you everything that we are. As we just come before you and we receive the word from heaven, as we open up your truth, as we open up your word, God, and we don't just read the word, but we let the word read us today, God. We thank you that as we draw near to you, you come running after us. With every head bowed and every eye closed today as we're praying together, maybe you're here and you've said the same thing the disciples said. Man, all the mistakes I've made, all the things I've done, who can be saved? Can I just tell you, Jesus' Jesus's response to you is, with man, it's impossible. But with God, anything could happen. All things are possible in your life. Or maybe, maybe you can relate to Titus chapter 3 like me. That once you were disobedient and deceived, enslaved by all kinds of passions and pleasures. But maybe, maybe this would be a but God moment in your life. But when God revealed his kindness and his love, he saved us not by anything we've done, but because of his mercy. Maybe right now in this, in this moment, God wants to pour out his mercy in your life. And let you encounter his love and encounter his grace in a way you've never encountered it before. So right now as we pray before heaven, with every head bowed, every eye closed, if you would say, God, here's my life. I'm ready to surrender it all, to go all in with you, God. To give you my life, would you lift your hand to heaven and say, here I am, God. God, here I am. I made some mistakes. I've chased some mirages. But I'm believing right now in this moment, all things are possible with you. I'm believing right now in this moment, because of your mercy, you can pour out your kindness and your love into my life. And right where you're at, would you just pray this prayer with me? Say, God, thank you. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your forgiveness. Thank you for never given up on me. Thank you for always believing in me. Thank you for sending your son, Jesus, to pay the price for my sin on the cross. And right now, in this moment, and in this place, here's my life. All of it. I surrender to you. God, I want to live the way you want me to live. I want to do what you want me to do. I want to be who you created me to be. So right now, God, fill me with your presence. Fill me with your love. Fill me with your life. My life is yours. In Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen.